That's all there is to that. Okay, the topic. Let's see, I already did my bit from Shakespeare. Or was it Tennyson? I forget. Anyway, uh, the topic is the universe contains a maybe. And I would like to propose that the whole world might go stark, staring, sane if people use the word maybe more often. Uh, this seems like a simple enough semantic reform, but just think what it would be like if Pat Robertson or Jerry Falwell or any of them <laughs> were to be saying, maybe Jesus was the Son of God, and maybe God hates gay people. I uh, think, think of the... Uh, Think of the Middle East if the Arabs were all saying, maybe there is no God but Allah, and maybe Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. Imagine Psychops saying, maybe all the scientific research we don't like has flaws in the, the methodology, instead of all the scientific research we don't like must have flaws in the methodology. People don't give enough importance to maybes. Uh, the world seems to be divided up between theists and atheists. And I've never been able to see any sense in either of those propositions. I used to be an atheist a long time ago. I had to give up because I couldn't think of anything to say during a blowjob. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, random chance, random chance. <laughs> That, that, that just does not convey the gravity of the situation. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the uh, resident Putsch, uh, otherwise known as President Bush, uh, is promising to give away huge sums of Moodle to faith-based organizations because, after all, all the research-based organizations tend to come up with conclusions which contradict what his followers want to believe, whereas faith-based organizations generally support what his followers want to believe. So it makes sense to give money away to faith-based organizations and cut back on the funding for research-based organizations. So I've written him an open letter, which is getting all over the World Wide Web, I've found out. It's on my web page, but others have been picking it up and printing it elsewhere. And I, of course, sent a copy to the White House, the president at whitehouse.gov. You, you all ought to know that address, president at whitehouse.gov. It's a great place to send all of your acid visions, your most surrealistic dreams. <laughs> yeah. The, the ideas you get while looking at Three Stooges comedies while stoned, anything you picked up from Karl Marx or better still Bakunin or Max Stirner. And, you know, I mean, we've got to educate George. He, he's, he really obviously badly in need of it. And since he wants to turn as much of the federal government as possible over to faith-based organizations, since this is the, allegedly the Association for Consciousness Expansion, which seems actually to consist mostly of druids, witches, Wiccans, uh, Thothelamites, and other people into uh, neo-paganism. I think you should all apply for grants, too. You, you have a faith-based organization, and why should the Christians get all the gravy? Uh, and I, I, what I suggested to, to uh, His Royal Fraudulency, George II, was that uh, one of the things that faith-based groups would take could take over very well and be very eager to do would be capital punishment, which is perpetually a matter of controversy. It's been uh, abolished in every industrial nation in the world except the United States, and in the United States it's been abolished in 10 out of the 50 states. But still, it's tremendously popular with the places that voted most heavily for Bush, the middle part of the country, which we're right. We are in the belly of the beast right now, believe it or not. We're right in the Bush country. Ever see Vixen? That was the premier soft core porn movie of the 1960s, and it opened with that memorable line, Bush country. <laughs> with a shot of jungle foliage, you know. 
Yeah, when, when I, uh, back in the 80s, I was going, late 80s, I was going around to all my workshops, seminars, lectures, etc. I was pointing out that when I grew up in Brooklyn, quail meant vagina. That was the slang for vagina. So we had bush and quail in the White House, which was pubic hair and vagina. I don't know that. Now we got bush and dick. <laughs> Are the Republicans trying to tell us something? <laughs> Are we just not getting the message? But if we, but if we, but if we did, <laughs> a professional comedian does not laugh at his own jokes. But of course, I, I'm not a professional comedian, so what the hell? Now, if you look through anthropology and paleoanthropology, etc., you'll find out that human sacrifice goes back to the idea that if you kill somebody and scatter the remains over the crops, you'll have better crops next year. And this is the origin of capital punishment. At first, they thought the best victims were virgins. Somehow or other, the virgins formed a union and got that idea made politically incorrect or something. So now they decide you've got to commit a serious felony. Although the number of felonies has been steadily increasing in England in the 19th century, there are over 200 felonies that you could be hanged for. Now it's down to murder and uh, piracy on the high seas, I think. But uh, still, we got, we, there is a basic belief in the unfortunate citizens who have less than five million brain cells. Uh, the average, uh, the average for human beings is 200 million, uh, the, and these are the and, and these people still believe if you don't kill enough people every year, where the crops will fail, the, the, the emperor will get sick, the country will fall apart, or everything like Oedipus Rex, you know, all the major calamities will. So they got to keep sacri a regular sacrifice. Now here's where faith-based organizations have a great big opportunity. They can resume their former practices under the authority of the federal government and we get lots of boodle for doing it, which will cut down on the federal expense, expenditure for executioners. So if we let the, we turn the felons over to, let's say, uh, each, each faith-based group can make a bid on how much they want to execute the felons in a given state. And if the Catholics outbid everybody, they can burn them at the stake according to their <laughs> faith-based traditions. The Protestants can hang, hang the ones in, if they make the lowest bid. The Sikhs can chop their heads off. The Mormons can shoot them. The Jews, the Orthodox Jews and Muslims can stone them to death. And here's where there's big money for the neo-pagans. You can p could put them in w w wicker cages and kill off a couple of hundred head at a time and make bigger profits than anybody. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the path to success for neo-paganism under the Bush regime. And I hope you all have, I hope you all take full, write to President Bush and offer your services. Tell, tell him about the ancient uh, Celtic rituals of herding the prisoners into Celtic, uh, into wicker cages and setting them all off at once. Tell him you'll add uh, Roman candles, because I'm sure once the idea gets across, they want to do all this on television. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you like to see the bishops with their mitres and those hat, funny looking hats and the Pope with his yarmulke on and all? all this stuff uh, presiding over a burning on, on television. Now, this would knock NYPD blue off the rating. <laughs> it might even dent the Steinfeld reruns. <laughs> and when the Protestants get to hanging again, you know, hanging, William Burroughs called it the orgasm death gimmick because when your men are hanged, and they usually hang men instead of women, I don't know why the feminists should look into that and raise it. <laughs> Equal rights for women. You know, I mean, why should men be? Why should men have the be the only ones having? If you, when you're hanged, you get an erection, and sometimes you have an ejaculation too. That is, if you're a male, I don't know. 
they haven't hanged enough women for me to have any data on that. <laughs> but uh, this would be, imagine, imagine the thrill of this, watching the guy die while he's getting a heart on. I mean, th th this would be the top sh TV show of the year. <laughs> Maybe the Protestants will outbid everybody else. But then again, the Orthodox Jews and the Muslims with their public stonings, that makes quite a spectacular. You can use overhead shots, handheld cameras, move in for close-up. I mean, it would really... Uh, this would really make the news worth looking at again. <laughs> and they could hire Anthony Hopkins as narrator. <laughs> you, you, using not the Dr. Kellogg Midwestern voice from the Road to Wellville or the English Butler voice, <laughs> or you know, any of his thousand, or his Nixon voice. Or any of his thousand, but only the one and only Hannibal Lecter voice. And as each spire is ignited or each stone is thrown, he can just repeat with the same innocently, goody, goody. <laughs> 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 yeah, Hannibal made a hundred million dollars its first year, its first week in release. So think, I mean, why did George? Well, we know why George Bush won because his brother fixed the election for him, and the Supreme Court is as crooked as the rest of the government. But theoretically, he won because more people wanted him, even though you can't see that in the vote returns. But. His major appeal was as uh, an exponent of capital punishment. This is a very important thing to most of our fellow citizens. They really think the crops will all die if we don't do enough human sacrifices every year. Now just imagine if we put a maybe in there, maybe the crops will die if we don't do enough human sacrifices every year. Or maybe one sacrifice a year is enough and every state doesn't have to do their own. So we can draw lots and one person in the country gets elected to be the sacrificial victim for the crops. And then after that maybe there'll be an experimental year which they try not executing anybody and see if the crops come up anyway. We could graduate from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age overnight. Instead of being the most industrially advanced third world nation in the world, we might become part of the first world, the, the, the civilized nations. That's just a thought. <laughs> I watched the last Bush-Gore debate on acid. Now, I want to tell you, <laughs> this is the only way to enjoy contemporary American politics. <laughs> hey, hey, you got the most notorious pothead in Tennessee, according to everybody who ever knew him arguing with the most notorious coke freak in Texas, according to everybody who ever knew him, about who can most effectively fight the war against some drugs. <laughs> you ever notice they never say the war against some drugs, they say the war against drugs. I have a friend who told me her daughter got, who had some kind of flu or something, she took her to the doctor. And the doctor examined her and says, I've got a drug that'll fix you up in a week. And the little girl screamed. She says, I'm not supposed to take drugs. They told me in school. They never say some drugs. They say drugs. And children are being terrified of doctors now. I think it's, I think behind all uh, this whole war on drugs is a secret conspiracy of Christian scientists. They're the only ones in the country who don't use any drugs. And they want to get us used to the idea that drugs are evil. So they start out with, the ones that are controversial, and they, but they keep repeating war on drugs, war on drugs. Now they're raiding herbal healers. They're going after midwives who don't even, midwives or midwives, the pronunciation varies from one part of the country. Yeah, they don't use any, they don't even use herbal aids, most of them, but they're just doing something different than the AMA. If I were a conspiracy nut like Richard Belzer, say, or Detective Munch, uh, I would say the AMA is behind this whole thing. They want to put all the competition out of business. Fortunately, I don't indulge in paranoia. I only wallow in it. But I <laughs> but uh, uh, there's a great website that uh, shows George Bush at a football game. 
and he's busy every every couple of minutes. He reaches up and picks his nose. I, well, I can if George Bush can do it, I can do it. He does this every couple of minutes. A few minutes later, he's doing this again, and they put a caption on it: "How to deal with Coke Flake." <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know what happened to that website. I put a link to it, and now it's dead already. But a lot of other anti-Bush websites are still up, so I don't think it's government's. I think the person who put it up didn't have enough money to keep it up for more than a month or so. Alas, somebody else will put it up against, put it up again eventually. I mean, we, if we're going to have a president like this guy, we might as well enjoy the humor of the situation, because in the immortal words of Hannibal Lecter, Things which seem gross and offensive in the instant may become, with a slight change in perspective, somewhere between droll and riotously funny. <laughs> and that's the way I prefer to look at American politics. It seems gross and offensive at the, in the instant. But when I think it over, it becomes somewhere between droll and riotously funny, a pothead running against the coke freak on an anti-drug platform. <laughs> Everybody's supposed to pretend they don't know the, the history of these guys, even though it's all over the internet. They still believe if it doesn't get in the mass media, nobody knows about it. They don't realize nobody believes in the mass media anymore. In 1998, I published a book called Everything is Under Control by Harper Collins, which has one of the best fact-checking departments of any publisher I've ever dealt with. I can absolutely guarantee everything in that book, that's a flat statement and not a maybe, has been checked by not only their fact-checkers, but, but by a libel lawyer who spent two days on the telephone with me to make sure nobody could sue Harper Collins. They knew damn well they couldn't sue me because writers don't make enough money to make it worthwhile to sue them, so you sue the publisher. And Harper Collins is owned by Rupert Murdoch, so they know there's lots of money there. So there's nothing in that book that's libelous so that the fact-checkers could prove untrue. And most of the references are to the World Wide Web because uh, that's where you can find out what's really going on. Nobody, oh yeah, I quoted in that book a poll taken by the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and the Christian Science Monitor together that shows that 75% of the public doesn't believe what they read in the newspapers anymore. The percentage who don't believe what they see on TV news is even higher than that. It's like 85%. We all know the bastards are lying to us, and but they never and and they get away with it because people are used to yes or no, and we every every four years to give us the sense that democracy still exists, they give us two goddamn motherfucking liars, uh, and I mean I I, I I like Shakespearean English down to earth earthy English that describes what I'm talking about. I don't like prissy little euphemisms. So they give us two motherfucking lying bastard sons of bitches. And they say, choose between them, you're free, you can have a choice. Which, which lying bastard do you prefer to the other lying bastard? And you, you know what happened in this last election? Nobody won. <laughs> really. Uh, the official figures are Al Gore got about 22% of the vote. George Bush got about 22. I'm talking about the popular vote. Got about 22% of the vote. Minority parties got 5% of the vote. And nobody got over 50% of the vote. Uh, most people didn't vote at all. That's a vote for nobody. Now, if you count the votes for minority candidates as votes for no nobody, that means nobody got got 55% of the vote or more than Bush and Gore had added together. So, so nobody should be in the White House. <laughs> nobody, nobody had the clearest victory in American politically. He beat both of his opponents. He beat both of them added together. And, he, and besides, nobody, you, you can trust nobody, uh, as they say, <laughs> as they say on the X-Files. There's a, great, there's a great website called the Bush Crime Family, which has the musical theme from the X-Files on it, by the way. Uh, no, no, nobody uh, will lower your taxes. You can count on that. Uh, nobody, nobody can represent you better than you can represent yourself. And be, above all, nobody makes better apple pie than mom. <laughs> so, 
So Bush is obviously a pretender. He should get the hell out of the White House and let nobody move in. <laughs> what do we need representatives for anyway? In the 18th century, when we got rid of the first King George, Actually, he was George the Third. We sort of lost track of the numbers. Now we think of this guy as George the Second, but his father was George the Fourth, so he should be George the Fifth, actually. <laughs> but who, who's counting? I mean, who's paying? Uh, well, we copied the English system of government, just removed the king, and made the, put in more checks and balances. But that was because we couldn't all go to Washington to represent ourselves. Most of us were farmers in those days, except for those of us who were slaves, and those of us who uh, had fortunate enough to own big farms and have lots of slaves. Uh, but um, we couldn't all go to Washington. We had things to do at home. So we had representatives. So meanwhile, 200 years passed, and we've discovered that our so-called representatives don't represent us at all. They represent the people who pay for their campaign finance. It cost, well, it cost $2 billion for the last election. This is for the donations to the presidential candidates, the Senate, the House, and, and the governorships that were up this year. Where does all that money come from? Do you think it comes from nickels and dimes, from widows and orphans? Well, look at Jim Hightower's website. He's got a list of corporations that donated over half a million to both Bush and Gore. So no matter who won, it comes to 34 million from these few corporations alone to each candidate. This means that whoever won the corporations would still be running the country. We all know that now. The corporations propose and we choose between the choices they give us. And so, that, so not only are they not representing us, but we don't even need them anymore. We can represent ourselves through the Internet. We can use the World Wide Web and email and chat room. We can, we can negotiate among ourselves, and we don't need representatives. Buckminster Fuller calls that de-sovereignization. We don't need sovereigns. We can all be self-governors, self-representatives, by, by making negotiated agreements with those people we come in contact with as to what rules of courtesy and honesty we will obey. And if you obey the right, uh, if you obey the rules of courtesy and honesty, you'll never be afraid of Hannibal Lecter again. Because if you study those three, now he never kills anybody who hasn't done something that he regards as gross or uncouth. I mean, he likes, uh, he, may, he may have strange ideas about gourmet cooking, but his ideas about justice are very close to my own. <laughs> <laughs> How many people here have read the novel Hannibal the Third in the trilogy? Only one? My God, you people don't have any literary interest at all. Oh, so. <laughs> well, I'm going to be a spoiler because there's been so much controversy about it already, and they're talking about how the movie has a slightly different ending. At, at the end of Hannibal, he uh, lobotomizes a candidate for Congress, a Justice Department official of the most corrupt variety, the kind of people, the kind of guy that's given the Justice Department the infamous reputation it currently enjoys, who's running for Congress. And Hannibal kidnaps him and uses an autopsy saw to remove the skull cap, and then he uh, takes out the frontal lobes a spoonful at a time, dredges them in spiced flour, <laughs> uh, sautés and garnishes with caper berries and, uh, and parsley, and has a, well, it was, it's one of his gourmet masterpieces. It's too bad the editor of Gourmet magazine couldn't be there to share it with him. But uh, <laughs> this, is, no, <laughs> this is just the hors d'oeuvre, the main course is, uh, what is, oysters and bacon, and I forget why, I mean, you know. But uh, he has done two things there. He has demonstrated that even politicians can have a practical use. <laughs> <laughs> and he has demonstrated that uh, the proper attitude of respect toward Congress that I think we should all have. <laughs> After, uh, the only thing I don't like about the ending is Hannibal disposes of the remains afterwards. 
I think he should put the skull cap back on since Hannibal was a surgeon before he became a psychiatrist and he knows all about this. That's how he could saw the skull cap off so neatly. Uh, he should sew it back on, keep him under anesthesia, mild anesthesia, until uh, stitches can be removed, let him heal up, and then put him on a street in Washington. I bet the guy would be in Congress within a year anyway. <laughs> you don't need frontal lobes in Congress. <laughs> Hell, he might even have got into the White House by now, come to think of it. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe, maybe, maybe George Bush isn't as dumb as he pretends. But J.R. Bob Dobbs, the Mahatma Guru of our new aeon. Praise Bob. Praise Bob, yeah. Did Ivan get here already? Where is he? Oh, fuck him. We won't come into him, my lecture. I won't go to hear his lecture. <laughs> I'm the only one who read Hannibal. Yeah. Oh, oh, hi, Ivan. Mean, oh, I thought you were Bob's outside. Not here, but, I mean, Bob's oh. office is here. We couldn't make it because something about a great deal on statistics or something. Weapons in the Ukraine. He's signing some contract, you know, breakaway Russian. Ah. Well, I'm glad, to, yeah, I'm glad to see you again. What the hell was I talking about? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, you don't need... taste of congressmen's brains. Yeah, you don't, well, just the frontal lobes. Uh, in the movie, Hannibal, Hannibal saves the rest of the brain and generously offers it to another passenger on the plane. His last words are, remember what Mommy told you. Never be afraid to try something new. <laughs> I love Anthony Hopkins. I, I think the novel is better than the movie in every respect except one. The movie has Anthony Hopkins. Nobody can play Hannibal Lecter like, nobody can play anything like Anthony Hopkins. And he added a few lines to the script, of which my favorite. I've been practicing every day since I saw the movie to try to get Anthony Hopkins' intonation. Goody, goody. <laughs> That's when he hears Clarice has been reassigned to his case. Clarice, I hear they're going to have you on my trail again and you'll be crafting my doom or trying to. Goody, goody. <laughs> Anthony Hopkins says he, that voice was inspired by Hal 9000 in 2001. <laughs> Anyway, uh, as I was saying, if Christians would say maybe Jesus is the Son of God and the Muslims said maybe Muhammad is the prophet of God, we have a much saner world. Um, at this point, I think of another movie. Believe it or not, I am talking about the same topic. I'm just approaching it from different angles. Uh, I was going to talk about Schrodinger's cat. But I've done the Schrodinger's cat rap so many times, I'll either leave it to the end or leave it out entirely. Uh, there was a chap named Elmi or something or other, maybe. Nobody knows his real name. He's generally referred to as Elmir. He had several last names spelled different ways, and sometimes he had the title Baron Elmir de Hori. Sometimes he was Louis Rene. Uh, he had, well anyway, he had quite a few names. He was busted in France for pa painting masterpieces. Nobody doubted that his paintings were masterpieces. They'd been authenticated by art experts. The only problem was he put the wrong signatures on them. Instead of signing them Elmire, he signed them Van Gogh and Cezanne and Picasso <laughs> and names like that. And this is known as art forgery. Now, Elmir's claim is a signature. It doesn't make that much difference. If it's a masterpiece, it's a masterpiece. If it's not a masterpiece, it shouldn't be in the museum in the first place. The, the argument on the other side is there are some among us, the Illuminati or the elite or the, uh, the experts, who can tell what's a masterpiece and what isn't. It's not a masterpiece until they authenticate it. But they authenticated a lot of Elmir's. So where does that put the where does that put the experts? 
Well, when he got out of prison, he wrote, a, he collaborated with a young American writer named Cliff on a biography of his whole career called Fake! Exclamation point. The exclamation point is an important part of the title. You got to know how to pronounce That tells you how to pronounce it. Fake! You know, you got to put emphasis in it. Also, it's a warning to the reader, I think. In the book, he confesses to painting over a thousand of the acclaimed masterpieces of modern art hanging in museums from Tokyo all across Europe and all through the United States. The Cleveland Art Museum is mentioned along with the Museum of Modern Art and uh, the J. Paul Getty Museum. Uh, about a thousand of the masterpieces of modern art. Now, all, all, all of the established art writers are all denouncing this book as a fraud. And they say, fake is a fake. <laughs> he may have forged a few and fooled us a couple of times, but he didn't fool us a thousand times. Elmer's reply is, they can be fooled. I've proven they can be fooled. You're going to trust these people? They operate 99% on bluff. So now every time I go through an art museum and I see some, I see, let's say, a Picasso, I especially like. He specialized in Picasso's early work, the blue period. Every time I see a blue Picasso I really like, I think, Jesus, that's great. Is that a Picasso or an Elmire? <laughs> and my only answer is it's a Picasso, maybe. <laughs> And then, then his co, the guy who wrote his wrote Elmer's biography, Cliff. His full name was Clifford Irving, and some of you may remember his full name. After Fake became a bestseller in 1968, uh, Clifford Irving got a contract from Harper Collins to do the biography of Howard Hughes. Uh, or the authorized, not just any buyer, but an authorized. He had a contract from Howard Hughes in which Howard Hughes gave him authority to write the true story of Howard Hughes' whole life, including all the sexual scandals, the political scandals, the, and all of his technological achievements. Howard Hughes was a very great inventor and uh, business entrepreneur, as well as being uh, one of the most remarkable lunatics of the 20th century. <laughs> and it, this was a well-drawn contract. Obviously, fine legal work went into it, and it was signed with Howard Hughes' signature. And as soon as it was announced that Elmer was getting, a, that Clifford Irving was getting a million and a half for a biography of Howard Hughes, uh, Howard Hughes announced he was calling a press conference, and he didn't appear at the press conference. There was a loudspeaker and a voice saying, I am Howard Hughes and Clifford Irving is a damn liar. We never had a meeting and the contract is a fake. And Clifford Irving responded immediately, the voice on the loudspeaker is a fake. Let's have the contract checked by experts. So they hired three handwriting experts and the three right handwriting experts compared the signature with the signatures on other documents undoubtedly done by Howard Hughes earlier before he went into his reclusion, seclusion or reclusion, and the three experts absolutely guaranteed on the basis of their expert, their qualifications as experts or expertise, I guess you call that, but this signature, uh, this signature undoubtedly by Howard Hughes. So the biography started to move ahead, and then the voice was heard on the phone once more, denouncing it and demanding a further investigation. Meanwhile, all the conspiracy buffs got into the act, who had been saying for years that Howard Hughes was dead and wasn't in seclusion. So those who claimed he was killed by the mafia, who had a double impersonating him on the phone, got into a tremendous battle with those who claimed he was killed by David Rockefeller, who had a double imitating him on the phone. Uh, conspiracy buffs don't don't really enjoy fighting with the establishment nearly as much as they enjoy fighting with other conspiracy buffs. <laughs> and so we had three alternatives. Did we believe the voice on the phone that might be a Rockefeller double or a Mafia double, or did we believe the signature authenticated by three experts? Well, maybe the signature was Howard Hughes. Uh, maybe the voice on the phone was Howard Hughes. Maybe there's a lot more maybes in the world than we generally realize. How many times have you been walking down the street and you see somebody across the street? My God, that's Charlie, and I thought Charlie had moved to New York. What the hell is Charlie doing here? You get closer and it's not Charlie at all. Well, in general semantics, that's called identification. 
instead of saying that's Charlie across the street, you should think maybe that's maybe that looks like Charlie or that seems like Charlie to me. Then you wouldn't be so surprised when it's not Charlie. One of the basic rules of general semantics is avoid the is of identity. Like I see three UFOs a week at least. Sometimes I see four or five. I happen to have an apartment with a balcony overlooking Monterey Bay, and I get a lot of sky, you know. So I, I see. But seeing UFOs does not particularly impress me because I see UFOs too. That's unidentified, non-flying objects. <laughs> Most of what I see is unidentified <laughs> because I have trained myself to avoid the is of identity as much as possible and to put in as many maybes as possible. So I think things going on. I think maybe that's a satellite. Maybe it's an airplane. Maybe it's a swamp gas. Maybe it's a spaceship. I don't know what the hell it is, so they all remain <laughs> unidentified for me, and they don't for most people. The San Francisco Chronicle a few years ago had their reporter in the street ask three people on the street, "Do you believe in UFOs?" And four of them said yes, and two of them said no, and none of them are answering the question. They're all answering, "Do you believe in alien spaceships?" When I was speaking to the Irish Science Fiction Society in the question period. Somebody asked me, "Do you believe in UFOs?" And I said, "Of course." And this guy launched into a three-minute diatribe to the effect they're all sun dogs, which are heat inversions, which make strange light patterns. And when he finally ran down, I said, "Okay, we agree. We both believe in UFOs. You think you know what they are, and I admit I don't know what they are." <laughs> <laughs> Well, eventually the publishers decided there was so much doubt, and the art critics criticizing Cliff Irving's first book, Fake, claiming that uh, Almir did not do over a thousand of the classics in our museums. And one thing and another, they canceled the biography, and Irving was even prosecuted for fraud, although he was never did come out of hiding. According to Irving's story, he met. Hughes uh, on a pyramid in Mexico, and Hughes had hair so long it hung down to his ass in the back, and his fingernails were so long he looked like Fu Manchu, you know, you know like six-inch-long fingernails, and uh, it was sort of like Bigfoot, or maybe Chupacabra, or something. <laughs> and, and I wish the hell Elmer had done a painting of it in the style of Salvador <laughs> Dali. Dali. Dali once said, "The only difference between me and a madman is that I'm not mad," which is a distinction that's worth thinking about. Like, like the title, fake. You can think about it any time the television does isn't working and you got a long, lonely night. You can think about how many Picassos are really Elmers. Is the title fake a warning or just a colorful title? And uh, what was the third question I started with? Well, never mind. There's, lots of this, there's so much to wonder about. Anyway, uh, Salvador Dali, who, who was generally taken for a madman with a great talent for draftsmanship, to say the least of it, he certainly was one of the greatest. Artists for physiological and landscape accuracy, although the, the physiology and the landscapes are in arrangements you usually don't see unless you're on acid. But uh, Dolly was caught, or somebody was caught, with a couple of hundred blank canvases with Salvador Dolly's signature on them at the French border when he, in his old age, when he was living in Spain. Somebody going from Spain to France was carrying. Several hundred blank canvases with Salvador Dali's signature on them, and this led to a great deal of speculation, investigation, all of which came to nothing. But the generally accepted truth, which may not be the truth at all, I, maybe it's the truth. It certainly makes sense considering Dali's business sense as well as his artistic sense. He was selling blank canvases to art forgers because he knew there were plenty of forged dollies being created. He wanted his cut of the profits. <laughs> Every other artist in history has been ripped off by forgers imitating their style, like Elmer. Dolly figured if they're going to be ripping me off, I should get I should get a part of the profit. He gave he saved them the trouble of forging the signatures by doing real Dolly signatures. That would help the experts to authenticate them too. You know. <laughs> I'm thinking of starting a similar business. 
on the computer, I can print off hundreds of title pages with a title by Robert Anton Wilson. It's the one that people want to sell for Robert Anton Wilson. But then, then you run into the deeper maybe problem because Pablo Picasso was once approached, approached by an art dealer who said, Pablo, I've got a couple of dozen paintings here I've been offered. I got them on consignment. I haven't paid yet. I want you to authenticate them. Show me which ones are real and which are fakes. So Picasso started putting them in two piles. This is real. This is a fake. This is real. This is real. This is real. This is a fake, and so on. And when he threw one of them into the fake pile, the dealer said, Pablo, wait a minute. I was here the weekend you painted that. That's not a fake. Pablo said, it's a fake, I tell you. I can fake a Picasso as well as any thief in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes me wonder sometimes when i got to finish something on deadline, as I send it in, I think, is that a real Robert Anton Wilson? Or did I just fake one because I was in a hurry? And I'm never, I'm never quite sure. My, my universe is getting more and more full of maybes all the time. Orson Welles made a movie about Clifford Irving and Elmere and Howard Hughes and all the mysteries circulating in the movie is called F for Fake. And uh, it's one of my all-time favorite movies. If you look at my website, you'll see it's one of the 20 movies I recommend for everybody to see as soon as possible, to put their head in the right space so they can, so they'll be, so they'll be able to understand my books when they try them. And F for Fake, there's one scene near the beginning which doesn't seem to have any connection with the plot of the movie. It's Oya Kodor, who Orson introduces as a fabulously rich Hungar young Hungarian woman. And she's walking down a street in Paris, and you get shots of men. She's wearing a very tight, very short mini skirt. She's got a terrific belt on her, as we used to say in Brooklyn. And you get these shots of men's faces and Orson's commentary on the soundtrack about how all the men are watching her as she walks. And uh, at the end of the movie, Orson confesses that 17 minutes of the movie were faked. And uh, when you count back, you find out it's a lot more than 17 minutes. On a BBC interview, Orson said everything in that movie was a fake. Well, he was speaking in hyperbole to BBC because everything wasn't a fake. Elmia did exist. Clifford Irving did exist. The island of a pizza did exist. And I think even Orson Welles did exist. <laughs> there are a lot of other things, in the, and the art dealers in the movie did exist, I think. But the movie is full of fakery just to show that uh, fakery and art are impossible to distinguish. Now, I've seen the movie over as many times as I have. I'm pretty damn sure none of the men in the shot of Oya Kodor are looking at Oya Kodor. What Orson did, I think, maybe, he went around Paris taking the most noncommittal faces he could find, guys whose expressions were impossible to read, guys with no expression at all. Then he intercut them with shots of Oya Kodor walking down the street, and in conspiracy, with a technician called the sound mixer, he kept her heels clicking through the shots of the men's faces, so you think the men and Oya are in the same time sequence. And this is, of course, just a development from the witty type of editing that he did in his very first movie, Citizen Kane, where people in one scene seem to be answering people in another scene set 20 years apart in time. Wells invented the technique of wit as an editing device. Um, now, towards the climax of the movie, there's a scene where Elmir is rationalizing. Uh, Elmir was not only a great artist and a great art forger, if you can s still see a distinction between the two. Um, and he says, it's no crime to paint in somebody else's style. All, art, all students of art start out copying the styles of great painters. Many people have done paintings in the styles of other artists. <laughs> and I called it homage to El Greco or whatever, to, just to admit that they're borrowing. As a matter of fact, movie directors do it all the time. It's called an homage. Every time, uh, what's his name? The guy who made Dress to Kill, what the hell is his name? Every time he rips off Hitchcock, the critics call it an homage to Hitchcock. Everybody is doing homages to Orson Welles lately. It's not plagiarism anymore, it's an homage. The crime begins when you put the signature on, and you hear Orson's voice asking, and who put the signatures on the paintings? 
And Elmir says, I swear to God, I don't know. <laughs> now, Orson was probably not in that scene, because he tips you off in another part of the movie. Elmir is talking to somebody else, and he's trying to, since he thinks in Hungarian still, he was Hungarian, I think. I think that much has been established about this man of mystery. And he's trying to find the English word, and he's groping and groping, and Orson in Paris suggests the word, and in the beats a... Uh, Elmir pronounces the word with decision, like he's just found it as if Wells had prompted him. What happened was Elmir was searching for the word, then he found it, and Wells intercut himself in Paris saying the word. So it's like telepathy or something. <laughs> it is, it's a magical effect. Another fake, but it's art. Is it a fake or is it art? It, it's certainly humorous. You know Wells is in Paris because you recognize the scene he's in. There are several other scenes in Paris, so you know just where he is. Well, who, well, this is followed by sh close-up shots of Elmir and Clifford Irving after the question, who put the signatures on the paintings? And you get about ten shots alterating Elmir Irving, Elmir Irving, Elmir Irving, Elmir Irving, Elmir Irving. <laughs> Elmir Irving. And each, exp each one, they have a different expression. And this is what they all aim for in what's called cinema verite, which is the theory that you can show the truth on film which is sort of like the theory that you can tell the truth in words. Uh, it's one of those things believed by those who haven't had enough acid yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is undoubtedly not cinema verite. It's another one of Orson's artistic tricks. I think he selected out of all the footage of Elmer and Clifford Irving, all the shots in which their expressions were most ambiguous, then he put a clicking tock. He had the sound mixer put a, a, a clicking tock. Boy, I'm turning into <laughs> professor, I'm turning into Reverend Spoon. <laughs> a ticking clock on the soundtrack, so you think it's one continuous sequence. So you got the question: Who put the signatures on? You get these reactions from uh, from Irving and uh, Elmer, and you think they're reacting to the question, but they're acting to dozens of other questions asked by BBC interviewers who wasn't bought part of the film from and re-edited it to make it look like an Orson Welles film. You see why I consider this a great work of art, this film, because it's the only film, well, not the only, but it's the film that goes furthest in introducing us to the maybe world. In 1933, uh, 33, mystic number, uh, 33 degrees in Freemasonry, Jesus Christ was 33 when he was crucified, according to legend. Dashiell Hammett on his 34th birthday said, one year older than Jesus by Christ. <laughs> uh, it's got a lot of mystical connotations. In 1933, the atom was split for the first time, King Kong was released, and John von Neumann and Alfred Korzybski in two separate books both suggested that we need to think in maybes, that either or is just do not cover our experience. Uh, von Neumann's book was called Quantum Mechanics, and Korzybski's book was called Science and Sanity. And von Neumann just suggested we needed a three-valued logic in quantum mechanics. Everything in quantum mechanics can't reduce to an either or. We got yes, no, and maybe all the time in the quantum realm. Krzyzewski pointed out this, this is applies to human perception, too. I hit the table, and my hand didn't go through it. And I hit the table again, and my hand didn't go through it. That's why kids keep knocking food off the table. They are testing to see whether the law of gravity works all the time or only part of the time. <laughs> Children are very intensely curious, and they want to test everything. <laughs> the art of being a parent consists of running around after the little darling saying, don't put that in your mouth, and don't stick your hand in that electric socket, <laughs> things like that. You know, they want to test everything. Um, an ordinary perception, I do workshops in which I do perception experiments. I don't have time to do any of them today, but you can try with your friends. Well, get my book, Quantum Psychology. That will do your head a lot of good, and it will do my bank account some good. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a lot of experiments in there which you can do with friends to demonstrate that everybody perceives a different universe. Uh, if I had you all make a drawing of this room, which is something I sometimes do, as it looks from where you are sitting, they would all look different. 
because you're all sitting in different places for the first. But they would all look different because you all have different <coughs> styles of art. Some of you never studied art and would be very shy and hesitant and, and embarrassed. Some of you would be more professional, but they still all showed 50 different, approximately 50 different views of the room. Now suppose we try to find an objective view of the room. That would be an architect's drawing. Well, the architect's drawing wouldn't show the people, the emotions, the laughter, the whatever else is going, the boredom, whatever else is going on in here. And and that's not true either because it does, it's, it's two-dimensional. And it, it's, a, it's from some imaginary position which doesn't really exist in the sensory universe. If we all went up to the ceiling and had ourselves attached by ropes and made drawings of the room from up there, it wouldn't look like an architect's drawing. It would look like 50 different perspectives again, only from the ceiling instead of from the floor level. Now you know the answer to the Zen riddle, who is the master who makes the grass green? Why do sad people live in a sad world? Why do optimistic people live in a world that's getting better all the time? Why do angry people live in an angry world? We, our nervous systems uh, receive the signals they have been genetically programmed, imprinted, conditioned, and, and learned to perceive, and they ignore all the other signals. Most of the parts of the brain have to do with filtering out signals so we don't get confused by an onrush of too much information more than the central processor can handle. Because if we were to pick up all the information in the room, well, what we'd be getting would be built, may if I do my invitation to Carl Sagan, billions and billions and billions and trillions of electrons and photons all dancing around crazily in, in patterns that are only fuzzy and partially there. And these electrons and photons are made up of particles if you look at them one way, and they're made up of waves if you look at them another way. So maybe they're waves and maybe they're particles. <laughs> so to return to, uh, by a different declivity to our point of departure, if everybody used the word maybe more often, this world might become stark, staring, sane. <laughs> Just think of all the TV preachers saying, maybe Jesus was the Son of God. You want to bet on that? I'm taking up a collection for those who want to bet on it. <laughs> maybe Mohammed is the prophet of God. Want to bet on that one? Maybe the great goddess has returned. Want to bet on that one? <clears throat> well, I seem to have ten minutes to go, and I seem to have pretty much rounded out the topics I wanted to cover, except for Schrodinger's cat which I have covered so many times, I don't want to go into it again, so we'll have a 10-minute question period. Yeah, the thing with uh, Howard Hughes, was that an uh, irrevocable contract? <laughs> <laughs> it was revoked. So it was not irrevocable, not legally anyway. The, according to the gemstone file, it wasn't the mafia and it wasn't Rockefeller. It was uh, Onassis who had, he was kidnapped, held him prisoner on an island in Greece, made him a heroin addict and put a, an imitator in, in his place. So now we got three Howard Hughes theories, <laughs> along with five wills. <laughs> Any other questions? Did you, uh, this has nothing to do with uh, your earlier topics, but uh, you looked at like the, uh, the Gnostic Sophia stuff, you're, uh, you're, I've been kind of involved with that in some of your earlier works lately, particularly a coincidence. And uh, I was just wondering if you had any comments about the whole kind of Sophia. The what? Idea. The Sophia, you know anything about it? Well, I know the ancient Sophia. Yeah, like up the, um, the, um, I was kind of hoping you would have to say, but I was, uh, somehow I, I have an association between that and the whole idea of like an intelligence behind coincidence, behind synchronicity and that. Well, I can't comment on the, the, there's a modern Sophia movement or a cult or a church or something no, or a kind philosophical of school. Revival. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Kind of a what? Kind of, like a revival of Gnosticism. Yeah. Oh, well, I know a little bit Dick's about Nost. What? Yeah, I think it's Phil Dick's fault. <laughs> Probably, yeah. The science fiction writer. I know, yeah, I know Phil, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's like obvious. Phallus, uh, 
<laughs> what I what I remember, I love Alice. I think it's a great novel. Well, what I remember best is that I'm almost quoted in it, but not quite. <laughs> one, one, one dialogue has somebody saying, "Have you read Cosmic Trigger?" Robert Anton Wilson says, and he gets interrupted. And to find out what that character was going to say, I said, <laughs> I thought that was really cute. I think that's the best type of tribute. It makes people want to go, go out and read Cosmic Trigger to see what I said. <laughs> I'm very grateful to Phil for that. Uh, well, I don't know anything about the, uh, what's grown out of Phil Dick's work except for the Phil Dick fan sites. I never read any Phil Dick, so. Read Vallis, <laughs> read Vallis, and then read Ulbick. And then read all the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, have you ever read V for Vendetta by uh, Moore? I can't remember. What was the first name? So, Alan, Moore. Alan Moore. I swear he wrote it right after he read Illuminatus. <laughs> like, he had almost direct quotes from everything, like the Crowley quotes, the, uh, the uh, Hassani Sabah quotes, the, <laughs> the uh, Weishaupt quotes, like, all through it. Oh, well, uh, uh, plagiarism is the sincerest form of flattery. It's, it's actually quite an amazing book. It's a comic, and it's really well done. Who's it by? Uh, Alan Moore. It's basically, you know... How about Foucault's Pendulum? It's got all the themes of Illuminatus, and the ten chapters are named after the ten Sephiroth and the Tree of Life, just like Illuminatus. But like I say, it's the sincerest form of flattery. Besides hiring a lawyer, I, I, I agree with Lao Tzu, avoid the law courts. Yes? Believability aside, what's your favorite conspiracy theory? Well, what do you mean favorite? The, the most plausible or the most, uh, the most amusing? Uh, amusing. Well, I don't know if the word conspiracy is quite correct, but I, I think it, I think it counts as a conspiracy. The Federal Reserve. <laughs> I, 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 we we're supposed to believe that if they print a piece of paper with the right decorations on it and may wave a magic wand over it, it becomes money. Whereas if the mafia or you or me goes down in the cellar and does the same thing because we don't have the magic wand, it's not money. And people, uh, people pretend to believe in this so they don't even think about it. I've never had any explanation of why what the Federal Reserve prints is real money and why what anybody else prints is not real money. So to me, that, I, I regard the Federal Reserve as the biggest counterfeiting ring on the planet. Uh, the, the most, the, uh, the one, the conspiracy I find most hilarious is the uh, Christians Awake in Birmingham, Alabama. They have a newsletter which claims that not only are the Freemasons the secret rulers of the United States, which a lot of conspiracy buffs go for, but the Freemasons are all gay, which is a, which is a new one on me. That includes not only J. Edgar Hoover, but Franklin Roosevelt, Adlai Stevenson, Ronald Reagan, Gerald Ford, both Bushes, and Clinton. Uh, but not, not only are they all gay, but Jesus got so pissed off at, at this gay Freemasonic conspiracy going on for 200 years that he invented AIDS as a disease so intricate that science will never find a cure for it. And I wish to have an illustration of Jesus with one of those cute pink dresses he usually wears in Catholic art and two test tubes cackle. This will kill off a few million of those queers. He 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 he. I mean, I, no, I guess it really needs a Bella Lugosi voice. This will kill off a few of those queers. Ha ha ha. It's, you know, you can tell a lot about people by the god they worship. <laughs> <laughs> really, nobody worships a god much more intelligent than themselves or with better morals. <laughs> yes. Two questions. Um, first, is the Temple of Set still around? Last still I heard, yeah. Is still around? Yeah. Um, second question is, was there a connection between Anton LaVey, Marilyn Monroe, and JFK? Did JFK know about Anton LaVey? 
I don't know anything about that. Uh, Marilyn Monroe, I, I'm pretty sure, was never a member of the Church of Satan. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Jane Mansfield definitely was, yeah. And her daughter is now the lead actress on Special Victims Unit. How's that for a weird jump? <laughs> Yes. You were talking about the Federal Reserve. I just wanted you to, if you could go a little bit more in detail when you were speaking about our um, being able to be interdependent or governing ourselves over the Internet, and you spoke before, or actually wrote before, about um, digital money, using the use of digital money or on the Internet. Yeah, well, there are, uh, there, there are two parts of cyberspace cyberspace proper and crypto space. Crypto space uses codes which are theoretically unbreakable for about a billion years. There are those who claim that they're, they're getting faster and faster at breaking the allegedly unbreakable codes. But in the in crypto space there are businesses going on using their own money which they create for themselves for their own trade purposes and they pay interest to nobody. If the Fed ever finds out about it, they will, of course, this has been done in regular space, oh, a dozen times. Each time, as soon as the government, as soon as the Fed found out about it, they had the government close it down. Uh, and you can read about that in a book called uh, Native American Anarchism by Eustace Schuster. Or you can, uh, oh, well, there are several books about alternative banking schemes. Uh, look at my recommended reading list on my website. Well, instead of a book by Benjamin Tuck, he doesn't go much into the history, but he goes a lot into the theory of how non-interest bearing currencies can be created for use within a group without anybody getting cheated and without anybody paying usury at 60% for the 60th time the same dollar goes around. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Was uh, Nostradamus Prediction on President Bush, a fake prediction? <laughs> <laughs> That's fake. Well, I, uh, maybe. But <laughs> I suspect the, the Nostradamus thing was so clear that I can't believe it's Nostradamus. Nostradamus usually seems to have at least 12 possible, inter which is why he's so popular. <coughs> Every generation you can find new meanings by just reinterpreting. This one seemed to refer so specifically to his royal fraudulency that I think it must have been invented. Although I got a great letter on my saved file that somebody sent me who found 14 references to Bush in Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> I think Finnegan's Wake is more reliable than Nostradamus, actually. I think it's time we cleared out and let the next crowd in.